everybody. Um, my name is Alicia Montoya. I work for the Swiss Re Institute, which is the R&D arm of Swiss Re. And today I am here with my colleague Antonio Savona, who's our data and tech lead at the Swiss Re Institute, to talk about the difference between big data and good data and how Swiss Re is using machine learning to plug insurance data gaps. Now, uh, for those who don't know, uh, a reinsurer is uh, a company that covers or insures governments and insurance companies. So we're like a financial cushion to uh, insurers and governments to make sure that when disaster strikes, both governments and insurance companies can cover it and help us all manage our risks. And um, in order to do that, we need access to good data that can help us predict, manage, and recover from risks as quickly as possible. And for that, we need good data. And so today we're gonna to explore what are the kind of uh, insurance data gaps that we have and what kind of approaches are we taking in order to plug them. So let's get started. Let's go into the first slide. Great. So how do we turn data into information and information into insights that allow us to predict risks uh, so that we can mitigate them as much as possible, then manage them once they're happening. How can we best uh, allocate resources and react to them and re 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 redirect uh, people and uh, traffic and uh, uh, use the resources ideally? And then um, how do we help people and companies bounce back from disaster? So for example, if uh, your business has been hit by a hurricane, how can we help you as quickly as possible reestablish your business? Or if your home uh, has been uh, hit, how can we help you better react? And so it all it's all down to having the right risk insights, but to get there, we need good data. And so really what we're trying to do here is kind of solve the answer to everything because in today's globalized and uh, digitally interconnected world, uh, we are trying to solve for risks that are interconnected. And so we end up having to solve the answer to everything. And the answer to everything is really uh, at, at the heart of the answer to everything is data. And so there has been a lot of funding on enterprise uh, machine learning uh, over the last you know, decade, but we have not um, managed to uh, make the significant advancements that we could have made with machine learning because there are a number of gaps. So today we're gonna to explore uh, some of the challenges that we face and then a couple of use cases as to how we're uh, tackling them and, and what's coming next. So first of all, in order to address some of the key insurance challenges, we need clean, actionable data. And that means the right data uh, at the right time in the hands of the right people. And what are the kind of things that we solve for so, for example, in the claim space, uh, we can use uh, AI to enable better claims management and uh, uh, enable the, 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 the virtuous circle of once we understand claims better, we can develop better products, which will then enable fewer and fewer claims because we're improving the product and claim life cycle. A second area that is absolutely critical to what we do is natural catastrophes. And uh, natural catastrophes are a big part of what Swiss Re covers because these are typically the very big risks that uh, governments or insurers can't cover on their own. The third area, which is really at the heart of what we do with data and analytics is risk modeling. So we take our own past data of risks and then we, we enhance it with new types of data like sensor data, uh, satellite data, and so we improve our models, and, and this enables us to pre predict, uh, manage, and uh, react to risks better. The fourth area that might in a little bit more detection. So how can we use um, uh, machine learning to identify or, or, or uh, uh, yeah, find areas that just don't look like they're inside a pattern that we expect. And then we, you know, it helps us look into uh, places that would otherwise require a lot of manual work. Finally, process automation. There's a lot of things that we used to do by hand and that we now 
uh, are are aided by a technology uh, in order to do things faster so that we can focus on the parts that really matter, which is really the risk modeling part and the product development. Next slide, please. So machine learning driven data augmentation and intelligible ontologies enable underwriters, those are the people who, who, who uh, sign the risks, to access curated data sets that can power uh, the kind of predictive risk modeling that we want to develop in order to better man to avoid as many risks as possible. Because of course, everybody prefers to avoid the risk rather than be paid afterwards. And so uh, in order to do that, there's a whole process that you can see on screen there that needs to happen. And, and a lot of it is data engineering to from the data acquisition through the cleaning until we can have uh, the right uh, kind of data uh, data trans transformed into uh, information that can then become actionable insights for our clients. Next slide, please. And so our research found that only 10% of companies are at that point where they can really leverage uh, the data that is that is there. And so we dug a little deeper, and this comes from the five dimensions of enterprise AI, uh, and what we what what was found is that most companies are really just not there yet when it comes to the setup and the skills and the and the uh, processes and technology that is required in order to really leverage uh, data. And so um, I think one one of the ones that 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 struck me the most is that you know most people fifty one percent were like some data is accessible to start building POCs, but nowhere near enough for us to really action it. Next slide, please. So today we're gonna to look at two uh, data gap examples. One is around data inconsistency in the area of claims, and the other is around incompletion of data in the area of property. And we'll go a little bit deeper and we'll uh, explain what are the kind of data we do have, and then what is what? Are, how are we using machine learning to then complement that data and be able to do better risk modeling uh, and analytics. Next slide, please. So what did claims look like before? Claims was absolutely manual and you had to send a claims adjuster to check on the data and to do all the paperwork and then file the paperwork and then the claims people would then go into the paperwork. And of course, there was no way to leverage one case against another except in a human intelligence. Then we started digitizing uh, through what we now call classical digital methods, where we started uh, putting data on, on databases and text mining and, and setting up rules, et cetera. What we have now, and really there's a lot of work still to be done, but, but there's, there's quite a bit of good examples is that we're now using natural language processing for feature extraction. We're doing uh, uh, AI powered risk mitigation and we're doing fully automated processes like claims management, which is really not where uh, we can bring added value. We're also using things like computer vision to help us in our claims detection and uh, management process to make sure that our human AI, <laughs> our human eye intelligence is focusing on the parts where we really add value. Next slide, please. So the second case that Antonio will look at in much more depth is uh, property. So with property insurance, just think of your house or your company as the place that is being insured. Now you provide a limited amount of information to an insurance company and that can maybe be a, a single geocoding uh, uh, type of information or uh, missing building characteristics information. And so how we need to do the modeling is based on past data and then uh, traditional models. What we're doing now is we're actually using hybrid geocoding systems. We're, we're using uh, additional, extracting additional data from buildings and linking that exposure data in order to be able to power more analytical models that can then give us a much better understanding of our portfolios, our risks, and help us and our clients do better business. And so with no further ado, I will hand over to uh, Antonio, who will take you through some examples of how we're using machine learning in those two cases. 
Thanks, Alicia. So let's start with claims and more specifically with fraud detection for claims. So as Alicia mentioned, uh, um, a claim is basically about paying uh, an entity uh, for a damage or a loss that occurred, or maybe not paying them. So in fact, wherever there's money involved, uh, there's an element, a possible element of fraud, uh, and spotting this fraud is uh, uh, a large part of our business. Now, a claim is a complex data type that comes with many different features. Some of them are static, some of them are dynamic, evolved through time. And we've been on the market for uh, over 150 years, so there's plenty of data that we can use uh, uh, to create baselines, right? So this seems like uh, the perfect setup for an anomaly detection system uh, through which you can actually detect fraud. And that's exactly what we did. In Swiss 3, uh, this system is called Claim Development Tracker, and it consists of three major blocks. The first one is the claim classification. So basically through the static claim, the static features of the claim, we can classify the claim itself and come up with a set of baselines for the, some of the parameters that we can take a look at uh, during the evolution of the claim. And whenever there's some kind of divergence from the expected behavior, we can just raise a flag and someone can go and take a look at the claim because that's a possible fraud. So let's see this uh, system in action. So a claim comes in, there's a claim classifier, and in this case, we are taking a look at one specific dynamic feature that we call FGU from ground up, it's a technical term for insurance, which is basically the dollar value of a claim. So what the claim is worth at, uh, at a specific moment in time. So the claim classifier initially can't do really much when the first FGU's uh, reading starts to come into the system because there's no normalization process that is possible at this early in the stage. And uh, then new readings come in and the normalization takes place. And now these points become comparable. So one is the actual development of the claim for along that specific feature. And one is the uh, baseline, right? So in this case, they are the same, so there's no anomaly. And then they're very similar again. So rinse and repeat, or keep going uh, until uh, either the claim is closed uh, and settled, and means that there was no anomaly, there's no fraud, or in, like in this case, there's a divergence, uh, which means that uh, there's something uh, fishy about this claim. And so maybe someone has to go and take a look. Um, so fantastic process, let's uh, um, move to production. Now, these are the four stages of uh, product scaling. You start by identifying a market following your list of priorities. Then you run a test flight, which could be called limited deployment in your company or um, whatever, but it's basically a process of uh, um, deploying on a limited uh, um, set of um, uh, countries or just a, a specific subset of a country and collect metrics, uh, checking that everything is sound. Once you've been running this exercise for quite some time, uh, then you trust uh, the model to be working and you deploy it and you move to the next market. So let's take a look at uh, how this process worked for us uh, uh, for one specific uh, dollar feature, again, uh, the FGUs that we mentioned before, and five uh, uh, specific lines of business. Now, line, line of business is basically an area of business, as the name suggests. It can be like marine, automotive, et cetera. Um, we start with France, and mind you, the metric that we want to um, take a look uh, at here is that of the false negatives, because false, ne false positives are also very important, but it's not that as a result of this process we drag people to court. I mean, if something uh, suspect is uh, identified, uh, of course, we run additional validations. But uh, um, false negatives, on the other hand, mean that uh, there are frauds that we are not recognizing, so the product is not working. So we start with France and we see that it performs pretty well. So the numbers are quite low. We move to Germany, uh, looking good, Spain again, and then Italy. Well, numbers are not so not so good. Uh, and specifically one line of business, uh, I mean, numbers are terrible. So it just doesn't work. So Antonio, um, yes, I think the, the slides didn't uh, didn't update. Oh. You're, you're, you're switching slides, right? Ah, they're... OK, Is it so we're at, uh, we're at slide 16. Yep, I can see that, yep. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, for Italy, um, it doesn't work. So um, I mean, in shame, uh, having failed my own country, I go back to the drawing table. Uh, and you know, data scientists, uh, uh, when they have no clue, the first thing they try is some kind of clustering. In this case, we want to um, check that uh, uh, the initial choice uh, of partitioning the dataset uh, according to the line of business was a sound choice. So uh, we put all the claims, uh, uh, all the, the evolution of the claims, so all the baselines for, um, regardless of the line of business, for a single market. 
in the same uh, pot uh, from which we start the class, exactly probably the best picture you will see today, the one on the left. And then conceptually, we are clustering uh, these uh, uh, evolutions according to the shape of the development curve. Um, we run the a rule of the elbow to find out the optimal number of clusters. In this case, it's a seven. Uh, we discard the non-populated clusters, just two of them, and we end up with five uh, clusters. Well, St. Troy matched almost perfectly the answer of business. This means that the approach was sound and that uh, the choice of partitioning the data set according to the line of business was correct. So what's not working here? There's another interesting finding is that uh, uh, markets uh, are very similar. So the market is an orthogonal feature. So once you clean the outliers and you start comparing these developments, they look really, really similar. So you take a look at uh, Germany, it looks like that. And you move to France, it looks like that, as you can see, uh, very similar. Spain looks like that. And then we go to Italy and boom, again, nothing works. So what's happening here? So clearly there's a problem uh, with the data for Italy. So the, the bad news is that we have this problem. We cannot trust that kind of data for, uh, uh, for training an anomaly classifier for Italy. But the good news is that uh, we can do something a bit smarter than just reusing the training set for other countries to fix Italy. We can do something that is uh, um, called transfer learning, uh, and it's basically reusing the knowledge from the learning uh, um, that we got for those other markets uh, to actually plug the data quality gaps uh, in Italy. And so this takes us to the learning and uh, you know, the expected data development doesn't necessarily mean correct data development. So in this specific case, uh, the training set uh, for Italy was so polluted by frauds uh, that you know, fraud was almost the expected behavior, right? And so I guess the bottom line is uh, don't trust your data just because you have a lot of it. And uh, we move to the next case, which is uh, that of the property. So to cut the long story short here, in the interest of time, uh, property, um, we have features about buildings uh, and the more we have, we know about a specific property, the better it is because we can uh, uh, create more accurate pricing and we can create more precise models. And then this type of knowledge uh, is hierarchical. So once you know a lot about the properties, you can put this knowledge together and you can issue risk factors for um, for uh, entire blocks uh, or even cities, right? Um, and so on and so forth. So features that we'd like to know about, like uh, number of stories, uh, construction type, it was built, uh, you know, physical, tangible uh, features about the uh, um, a property. How much do we have about the properties? Well, the, the sad truth is that sometimes we don't have much, sometimes we have nothing, we just the address. And uh, how do we close this kind of gap? How do we bridge this kind of gap using machine learning? Let's see a very simple example here. You know the address, right? So one thing that you can do is leverage one of those data providers that can provide you additional information, like for instance, uh, um, in this case, a street view uh, data object about the property, right? Um, now, street view data objects are not uh, immediately um, usable. Um, you have to do a lot of pre-processing on top of that. Um, despite the, the loop, they are vectorized data, so you have to rasterize them and uh, you know, know a number of things. But in the end, uh, uh, you end up with uh, a picture of the property um, and it, it, with some tags and annotations, right? Then we can do analytics on top of that. We run a deep neural network and we can uh, find a scene description. In this case, we see that you know there are there are cars parked in front of that. We don't do much with this type of information, but um, we have the windows, right? And uh, a simple uh, geometrical transformation on the top of this piece of information, which is a you know a very dignified name for just counting the windows uh, in a column, we can uh, somehow understand the number of stories. So we synthesize this uh, uh, this feature um, starting just from the address of the property. Um, can we do more? So yeah, let's keep playing uh, Big Brother here and let's see what we can understand if we start looking from above, so from the sky. So satellite uh, maps uh, come in really handy here. So what can we do here? Uh, understanding the shape of the rooftop uh, is something that would give a, a lot of information. Like we can have the shape of the property if you think of it, right? Uh, but how do we train a system to do that? Um, well, you have street maps, for instance, that sometimes have parcel information so that are a good approximation of the um, of the rooftop geometry. You can use that to auto -auto automatically create your training set if you think of it, right? And then you can train a system to classify roof shapes. And using the system, um, you can then identify 
rooftops for areas for which you cannot be served by uh, by uh, street maps. And, and you, we yes, come right? to the 20 minutes. Yep. So yeah, rinse and repeat. We can use the same approach to so many other things. Understanding uh, the construction type of it, of uh, uh, the material type of uh, uh, the rooftop, and spotting vulnerability objects uh, on the rooftops, like chimneys, uh, skylights, uh, um, solar panels, and whatnot. So we started from a single piece of information: the location. And we understood so much about the property uh, thanks to machine learning. And this uh, um, takes to the learning, uh, the lesson learned. Um, plugging gaps in property is the key uh, to uh, more accurate risk modeling, something we knew already. Uh, but it was an interesting journey to uh, to find this validation uh, through this process. And in case you wonder, the red tile is here what we have, unfortunately, and the rest of the house is what uh, we have to find out. This concludes the presentation, and uh, hopefully, we still have time for question if thank you Antonio and I haven't I haven't seen any questions so far so and, uh, but if if anyone's still there because we're slightly over time and you have any questions we'd be happy to answer and if not I think we can close the session uh, you uh, have our contacts uh, through the, right. the organizer. If you do come up with any questions afterwards, we're also happy to answer. And if you have any great ideas on how to better manage claims and property risks, we always look out for collaborating with companies uh, and talent uh, worldwide in order to improve the insurance products and services that we offer. And as our motto indicates, to help make the world more resilient. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.